Okay, everybody. Hey, I am going to go ahead and try and video this lecture, The British Empire and Colonial Crisis, in case I miss class tomorrow, and because I, um, I think it might be a good idea to practice videoing these things anyway. And um, I think it'll catch everybody up but to the same place. I left off different sections in different parts of this lecture. And also, um, it might be helpful for some of you to be able to pause the lecture and figure out where we are and hear the material again. Release, release. Okay, maybe doing this with my dog down in the same room is not going to work. No. Okay, play with your bone. Here. Go. All right, so... Colonial, the British Empire and colonial crisis, what we're looking at is ways that England is trying to consolidate control and raise revenue. And we've been through the French and Indian War. I talked about republicanism and taxation without representation. And then we started looking at the important events that ultimately are leading us up to the American Revolution. And what I'm looking at when my eyes are away from you are the is the PowerPoint that you can follow along with as well. And we looked at the important events and developments of the 18th century. And I think, you know, most of you heard the Stamp Act discussion, 1765, and what resulted from that. The Declaratory Act, um, you should know what that is. And then how British troops came to occupy Boston in 1768, which led to the Boston Massacre. I think everybody's heard my lecture on that, and if there are any gaps, just let me know when I see you next. And the Boston Massacre was in 1770. Now, where I think some of you uh, haven't heard me talk yet, and where we left off in some classes, was with the Tea Party and the Tea Act. So that's where I'll start now. So you've probably heard about the Boston Tea Party going back to elementary school. And the Boston Tea Party um, resulted from attacks on tea. You probably know that. Basically what happened was that there was a surplus of tea that the British East India Tea Company had. So this is a, a tea company that is closely affiliated with England. They've got this extra tea and they're figuring out how are we going to get rid of it? Who can we get to buy it? And they come up with the idea that the American colonists can buy it. And they think that this will be a win-win, that the colonists will like this idea because what they'll do is they'll send it over to the colonies, the American colonies, and they'll essentially make the colonies buy it, but they'll lower the price. And this will be a good thing for the Americans because they'll get a good price. So Who's not to like that, right? Well, the colonists don't like it because they feel that this is another example of them being nickeled and dimed. So all up and down that sea coast that we've been talking about, colonists refused to either unload the tea from the ships or to um, take it out of the warehouses. They took it off the ships and they put it in warehouses, but then they wouldn't take it out of the warehouses and put it into the circulation or the places where it would be sold. And the situation was particularly tense, as it always is, in Boston. And in Boston, it turned into a real standoff between these very ardent, we might say radical patriots, people like Sam Adams and Paul Revere. You've heard these names before, and we've talked about them a little bit. Um, so it's between these guys and their followers and the, the British official who was in charge was named Thomas Hutchinson. And Thomas Hutchinson was a good British authority. He knew that what England was doing was not smart and a bad decision, but he felt that it was his obligation to do what England told him to do. So he told the colonists, look, you've got to unload this tea. You ha we have no choice, and you are making me look really bad in front of England, and please stop making me look so bad in front of England, so just unload the tea, and we'll all get on with our lives. And the Patriots said, no, I'm, we're just not going to do it. 
And so it was very embarrassing, at least for Hutchinson, and it was very tense for everybody because no one knew what was going to happen ultimately. And on the last night of this two-week window during which it needed to be unloaded, a bunch of patriots boarded the ships in the harbor where the tea was sitting, and they dumped it into Boston Harbor. And it wasn't like this big party scene. It was actually quite calm and, and, and controlled. They actually caught one of their guys trying to steal some of the tea and put it in his clothes so he could take it home. And, and they, uh, they were so mad and disgusted with him that they stripped him of his clothing and sent him home in disgrace through the streets of Boston naked, which is kind of funny, I think. But anyway, that was the Boston Tea Party. But that wasn't the end of the story because it was so embarrassing to England that the colonists had, did the, had done this to them. It was what one historian has called gesture politics. And you guys can imagine what the gesture was. I'm not going to do the gesture for you, but I'm sure you've seen it on Atlanta highways. It was very rude. And I just want you to imagine if you were really mad at your parents and what would be the most aggressive, ugly, embarrassing, rude, awful things that you could do to your parents? Well, that's kind of what the colonists were doing to the British on a world scale. And so the British were furious. They were disgusted and they were humiliated and and so they decided they would punish Boston. And what's one way that you can really punish a seaport city? What's the, the most severe way you can punish them? Well, remember the things that I told you about a seaport city and how much they're dependent on trade. They closed Boston's port. They brought in warships. They opened up those windows of the warship. I'm not really good with the terminology, but the cannons came out and they were trained right on Boston. And Boston was closed and under the weight and, and the fear of guns pointing at them. And this was really scary. And it was also, of course, economically devastating. So did the other seaport cities like Savannah or Philadelphia say, Ooh, good thing that was you, Boston, and not us? No, they said, oh, well, if Boston can do this to... I'm sorry, if England can do this to Boston, England can do this to us too. And so what it did was it resulted in the first display of colonial unity. In other words, for the first time, the colonies came together. And you might say we had our first colonial congress, our first example of a time. Sorry, I'm not really enjoying this angle. The first time when the colonists really came together to talk about what they were going to do. And they came together in Philadelphia. All the colonists, or colonists, representatives from all the colonies, except for one colony, I believe, didn't send anybody, to talk about what they had in common and what they were going to do about this crisis. I mean, at this point, they're not saying, or they're not all saying, ah, we've got a break with England, it's over, we're done, let's have a fight, let's have a revolution. Some are. But most are saying, how can we work this crisis out? And as you can see on your PowerPoint, it says, first meeting of the Continental Congress. They continue the non-importation movement. Um, and by the way, that closing of Boston Harbor is what we call the Coercive Acts, which you see on your PowerPoint in 1774. And it was shortly after that that we have what we 